Okay, it's just gone two o'clock um, here in Oxford, and um, um, it's a really very warm welcome to um, today's Centre for Global Higher Education webinar. This is number 344, if you're counting. I'm David Mills, and I'm really delighted to be introducing um, a, a, a talented suite of speakers today. This is the fourth um, webinar in um, a series um, entitled Contributions of Higher Education. And today we're thinking about contributions to national culture and region, regional leadership. And with us, we have Tehi Nokala, Jussi Valima, Tinia Romanesco, Alexei Egorov, and hopefully Sergei Malinovsky. And um, they're going to be talking about their contributions to this book that was published with Ed Edward Elgar um, and is available free for download, assessing the contributions of higher education. And the, the aim here is really to think about the broad engagement of higher education within um, a whole range of societal sectors. Um, and it, it's it's um, a hugely interesting collection of books. It started off as a, as a research seminar um, back at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow in 2019. Um, and I think it links and overlaps with a lot of Centre of Global Higher Education's work on the global public good. That's um, enough from me for now. I'm now gonna hand over to Celia to start um, this webinar. Thank you, David. And um, then there may I have the slides. Yes, uh, we will uh, give a short introduction to, to our chapter, Cultural Contributions of Higher Education. Uh, my name is Jussi Valima. I'm Professor Emeritus in the University of Jyväskylä. And my uh, colleagues, uh, Terhi Nokkola and Xenia Romanenko, uh, we'll also be pre presenting. Uh, Terhi also works in the University of Uvascula and Xenia in the High School of Economics in, in Moscow. So uh, I will tell uh, shortly the, the interview, uh, the, the overview, and then Terhi and, and Xenia will, will continue with more details. Next slide, please. Uh, well, first I would like to start that that writing this this chapter uh, is, has been a co-thinking and, and co-writing process uh, coming from different countries. Uh, it has helped and sometimes made uh, a bit uh, challenging to, to, to understand what we mean by cultural contributions. Uh, the main starting point for our chapter is that uh, cultural contribution is a topic that uh, challenges the, the hegemony, of, uh, hegemony of, of seeing higher education uh, and higher education institutions uh, primary through uh, economic indicators, uh, whether it concerns higher education institutions that, are, that have been uh, seen as um, engines of regional development uh, or emphasizing the role of, of, of uh, innovations and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the role of higher education in strengthening national economies or in the student life uh, emphasizing uh, education as a uh, as an economic investment. Uh, so we pay attention to to to, to this uh, topic of cultural and contributions of higher education, and to our uh, surprise, this topic has been has not really been studied uh, uh, as an entity. Uh, there are a number of, of studies focusing on, on separate cultural activities of higher education. Uh, student cultures uh, uh, and uh, and different cultural activities taken by by education institutions. Uh, we try to map the whole uh, landscape of what are the different perspectives that higher education and higher education uh, institutions uh, have contributed to to respective national cultures and international and global cultures. Uh, Culture is, is a challenging phenomenon. Uh, you can base it basically uh, on the street, like the picture uh, that is ta was taken in an American uh, city. Uh, uh, so uh, culture related to higher education, uh, it, uh, it includes both uh, students, uh, academics, different activities uh, promoted by, by higher education institutions, supported by, by higher education, uh, also including uh, activities of teaching, research, uh, and so forth. 
uh, as a social uh, culture is also a, a quite difficult topic to study because quite easily it is uh, it has a connotation of, of elite culture. So something that uh, are, uh, that artists do uh, in, in, in theater, uh, in sculpture, painting, uh, uh, cinemas, etc. But uh, culture is also a social phenomenon that describes how people see uh, uh, the world, uh, how they, what they think is natural. It's a social phenomenon that is shared by all. Uh, and in addition, it's an intellectual device to try to understand and explain how different uh, human groups, societies, academics work. Uh, in our chapter, we do not pay attention to, to higher education institutions as cultural entities even though we are very uh, aware that in inside universities there are disciplinary cultures, organizational cultures, uh, organizational identities. No, we will not study that. We will study the different the relationship between higher education and society from the perspective of, of uh, cultural contributions. I think I stop here. Terry, it's your turn. Okay, so when we try to chart, first of all, what are the um, uh, what are the different cultural formations and activities in universities? We looked at the websites of 120 universities located in capital cities of 77 uh, countries on all continents. And the aim of this exercise was to capture the kind of large vari variety of, of different kinds of cultural formations and not to count the numbers per se. Um, both the existence of different activities on the university websites, as well as, as how it, precisely the numbers are described, um, uh, often varies, and it's dependent on what each university decides to highlight on their website. The English language websites which we used in our exercise are typically more limited than the ones in the national languages. Um, some universities choose to give a very specific or precise number about so and so many museums, so and so many libraries, for example, whereas others merely mentioned many or several of these institutions. We categorize them into three categories. The first category covers a variety of historical buildings and modern buildings that may hold significance for cultural heritage, main buildings, libraries, churches, botanical gardens, places of cultural activity, such as cultural centers or bookstores. The cultural dimension in this category may be tangible, such as buildings or gardens, uh, but also intangible, such as knowledge about the past generations. The category that was most numerous on the, of the three, the libraries, alone make nearly two thirds of uh, this category. These buildings also can act as specific bridges between the university and the city and the community as places of communication and, and transfer of knowledge. The second category comprises a number of cultural activities which cater for the larger society uh, around universities, such as exhibitions, festivals or concerts, as well as partnerships with museums that are not maintained by the university itself. These kind of popular activities help to spread the knowledge uh, about scientific reasoning and contribute to a more scientific culture amongst Europe, uh, amongst people. Uh, and then this category also describes activities that are part of cultural industries, such as radio, TV, or record labels. The third category uh, differs from the other two in the sense that it caters primarily for the community um, inside the university. It pertains to different cultural activities um, that are organized by the university staff or especially students and, and the ones that they engage in. Um, and they may be organized by the university itself or the student union, for example. And these include a large variety of music, theater, and dance groups, debate societies, and literary clubs. Um, and I would like to re-emphasize that the specific number of given cultural formation is not what is important here to our argument. What is important is that all higher education institutions host some cultural infrastructure or institutions and engage in some uh, cultural activities, regardless of whether they're located in a global north or global south or uh, any specific continent or country. I will give next floor to Xenia.
So let me change the slide. Thank you. And from the university cultural activities, we should go to the urban cultural activities and urban cultures provoked and produced by universities, but due to their students. Because uh, nowadays students like a significant mini community in many cities. So as citizens, they influence urban cultures and establish special cultural places. And because students are not a unified group in now massificated higher education, so they can be consumers and influencers to very specific and very different ways of contributing to culture. So from closed toilet clubs to ethnic cafes, from street art to local monuments, this is how students can shape our urban structures. And uh, in our next uh, contribution to contribution, and we can uh, change our presentation. Thank you. Uh, we can say that the very specific type of cultural contribution is a university in cultural imageries. Uh, because uh, it's our point that the literature and TV and cinema, they not only reflect, but also shape our popular understanding of universities, of colleges, how professors look like, how students uh, live their lives. This is um, due to uh, this specific uh, university in um, as imagers. And uh, we found four main uh, ways of thinking about uh, universities in cultural imageries. Uh, first of all, they are special genre like college life movies or college movies and campus novel in literature. And this genre developed through the whole 20th century in accordance to the massification of higher education. And uh, they show uh, they show uh, universities as places of uh, friendship, common development, parties, sexual freedom, and uh, in addition, personal growth of students. So such things like Goodwill Hunting or Marriage Plot by Jeffrey Evgenidis or The Secret History by Don Natart and all uh, the continuation by different authors, they are uh, like a contribution to popular understanding what is university look like. Then a uh, university can be a context or a canvas uh, in the story like in um, Brides had visited or Stoner or Disgrace by Kutsi, uh, or like in uh, the TV series Endeavor, where uh, stories at the same time use this special visual culture, but in addition, just tell us about uh, social injustice, uh, problems, etc., etc. And of course, uh, the main point, this is um, this college movies or uh, campus novel shows the problems of uh, society in very many types from legally blonde to the dreamers or the brisky point. And the last thing that there's a special aesthetics uh, for subcultures and fan communities, the name of it dark academia and in addition light academia, which uh, can uh, influence and inspire people you know, to think about university like in this aesthetic way. That's all. The final element we want to highlight in our sort of brief tour of the overall different perspectives that we can we can use when looking at the culture culture and and higher education and their connections is to highlight the way in which cultural activities of universities has influenced, for example, wider political uh, events. And this we identified two mechanisms which we delve into a little bit deeper. The first example is research into cultural topics. For example, in the 19th century, in many European countries, the research and teaching into national disciplines such as history, folkloristics, linguistics, literature, and archaeology were important in vocalizing the national linguistic and cultural specificity. This national romantic discovery by academics gave rise to calls for national awakening and political self determination. For example, the ethno-linguistic nationalism in the fringe states of Russian or German-speaking empires in the 19th century, or the linguistic battles of the successor states of the Serbian-dominated Yugoslavia in the late 20th century, or for examples on how the academic linguistic research contributed to political mobilization. 
A second example or second mechanism is how student cultural events turned into manifestations of political sentiment, sometimes putting the conservative university and its more radical students at odds. For example, the student radicalism in Western Germany ignited into full flame by the decision of the rector of the Free University of Berlin to forbid the open meeting organized by student union with a critical author, Eric Kuby, in the spring of 1965. Later examples include, for example, the student song festival uh, La Gaudiamus in Vilnius uh, in 1988, where the forbidden flags of the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, were displaced and a choir of thousands of singers protected them from being taken down by the Soviet officials. The picture you can see on the slide shows the intersection of the two. It depicts the a spring picnic of students of the Imperial Alexander University in Finland in 1848. The cultural research that was conducted by the professors of the university ignited the sentiment of national specificity, leading to calls for Finland's political independence from Russian Empire. In the spring picnic of 19, uh, 1848, the song Our Land, Vortland in Swedish, uh, written by the Imperial Alexander University's Latin teacher, national poet Johan Ludwig Runeberg, and composed by its music teacher Fredrik Passius, was first performed in public in this event. It was later to become the national anthem of the independent Finland. At the same event, the university's professor of history, Fredrik Sugneus, gave a speech titled Finland's name, which gave voice to a national romantic notion of Finland and Finnishness, and eventually, half a century later, led to Finland's political independence. As a conclusion, what we'd like to say is that cultural contributions of higher education are, complex, are a complex global phenomenon, and further research is needed to understand the various mechanisms through which uh, cultural contributions of higher education can take place. Um, if we do not pay attention to the cultural contributions of higher education, we easily lose sight of the most important channels through which higher education institutions can bring value for citizens um, outside an economic sphere. And in this regard, the cultural contributions of higher education belong to the main public activity, activities offered by higher education institutions. I'd like to stop here and I think that then we can go to the next presentation. Thank you. So I can, can start, I guess, yes? Yes, please okay. do. Um, yeah, my name is Sergei Malinovsky. I'm working at the Institute of Education Higher School of Economics and uh, uh, me and my colleague Alexei Vigorov uh, has prepared this presentation and the uh, uh, chapter of the, uh, of the book and the topic is the higher education and regional elite formation in uh, Russia. Please, the next slide. Uh, why do we believe that uh, this quite a relevant topic? Uh, increasingly, researchers uh, are beginning to examine the relationship between higher education and high status positions. And uh, researchers highlights that universities offer many opportunities for promotion to the elite. For instance, universities transfer the privilege and prepare students for the very top position and uh, allow students to create useful nets, networks and uh, provide evidence for them of uh, the top performance uh, for the highly paid placement in elite professions. And regarding the political sphere and uh, political elite, there are also some empirical studies that show that graduates of higher education institution are vastly overrepresented in political bodies worldwide uh, of course, in comparison with the population in general. And in fact, uh, empirical studies show us and empirical analysis shows us that most contemporary democracies uh, are governed by disproportionately better educated cohort of people. For instance, in Denmark, in such countries as Denmark, Belgium, or, uh, or France, between 75 up to 90% of parliament members have the equivalent of college or graduate degree. Uh, the same situation as for uh, European Parliament, their, their university de degree is uh, uh, 
quite a strong prerequisite for attaining uh, influential post within the European Parliament. And uh, we should notice that the vertical stratification of higher education institutional landscape is uh, closely related uh, to the disproportional role of elite universities and their impact on formation of uh, political elites. Uh, for instance, Oxbridge produces more than a half of uh, judicial, yes, more than a half of judicial uh, parliament and governmental elites in UK. In France, pathway to top political position, not only political, but administrative and uh, business positions are strongly linked to the graduation from uh, Grand Ecoles in all this. And for instance, uh, law and economics major and uh, graduation from departments from Tokyo University or Kyoto University is crucial to enter Japanese administrative bureaucracy. The same is for Norwegian business school or for instance, uh, political science faculty in Ankara University. This uh, is a very strong hall and principal education institution for tracking, training uh, Turkish bureaucrats. So uh, West literature on social stratification suggests that higher education can influence the social structure, including formation and reproduction of uh, uh, this, the particular class of society, I mean elite class. However, other view is known uh, still uh, in relation to regional political elites, uh, especially underpinned with the representative data as we hopefully have uh, for our research. And we still lack evidence from uh, Russia. We can uh, move to the next slide. Uh, since uh, this was quite the first attempt uh, to analyze uh, quite the brand new data we collected that time, the main objectives of our research uh, uh, were exploratory. Here are our three questions. First of all, what is the educational background of the regional political elite in Russia? Second, is higher education, uh, higher education is an actual prerequisite for an elite position? And if so, what type of universities and majors attained could contribute the most to facilitate this uh, smooth moving to elite position at regional level? And this, the last one, how has the educational background of regional political elite changed since Soviet uh, times? The focus of our research is on the Russian regional elite, namely members of regional parliaments. And I guess Alexei uh, would say a bit more about this. The next slide, please. Uh, just before we jump to the Russian context, uh, a few words in general about what we know from the literature. Uh, why we believe that university degree can somehow be linked to taking a political elite position. We detected uh, roughly three basic approaches to ex explain this linkages. Uh, first of all, rather logical, and I should say probably over optimistic idea that the political elite are the best and the most prepared people in the country. And this idea dates back to Plato and Aristotle's ideal forms of the rule. And uh, taking into account the ongoing professionalization of political work on the one hand and uh, its academization and the appearance of so-called diploma democracy on the other hand, exactly and probably the only university is the entity that is able to provide the necessary skills for the future elite so it's not surprising that there are some majors and some fields of study like economics, law, or public administration that are best suited to prepare uh, one for a political work. And in this context, uh, we should assume that Russian elite uh, to be educated from the universities and fac faculties that are best suited for, for, for their future political work. Uh, second tradition, mostly in line with uh, Bourdieu's idea, says that universities, far from being necessary, the place where they teach the necessary and most valuable skills for political life. Rather, it's a place where future political elite polishes their cultural values and uh, patterns. And I guess the uh, colleagues and previous speakers uh, touched upon this point. And university. Uh, 
thus uh, might be a place that distinguishes an elite from uh, other groups of people in society and forms, in fact, their political attitudes and, as a result, uh, legitimize their right to be elite. Based on this approach, we can assume that Russian elite uh, should come from the most prestigious uh, uh, universities, uh, most selective, uh, as, as we actually see it um, in, in other countries. Uh, the, the last one, social capital approach, uh, stress upon the importance of social bonds, like uh, go and see in China, or bonds, social bonds, as it's called in Russian, that quite a popular narrative in, in, in Russia. Universities, uh, in fact, can create useful networks and cheap advantages through these social bonds in recruitment to a political position. And social capital attained in the university often works for uh, building this uh, self-identification of the elites and uh, graduates from university usually stands closer to the central nodes of uh, political networks, in fact, in Russia and other countries as well. In, in this sense, uh, one would expect that political elite to concentrate in the same universities, not necessarily the most prestigious ones and not necessarily the, those that uh, uh, provide the best expertise and best skills for political life, but uh, just the same, uh, the same, and though those where they can build the necessary and useful uh, relationships. Uh, and the last slide from my side: um, a few words about Russian context to to make it more clear uh, about what elites we're talking about. Uh, Russia has a federal structure and uh, consists of regions. Uh, each of its regions have their own government and own legislative bodies. Each uh, region, for instance, has a regional parliament that is in focus of our research. The usual term of election for regional parliament is five years and uh, average size, not average size, uh, size uh, range from, ranges from 15 to more than 100 members. And being, uh, frankly speaking, often subordinate to the administrative authorities, regional parliaments are still the key legislative uh, powers uh, at the regional level and uh, are no doubt recognized as elite destination at regional levels for regional power groups. Uh, frankly speaking, again, the regional election can hardly be called unpredictable. Uh, they are subject to electoral engineering and often relies on clientelism and depends heavily on the highest executive authority in the region, most often it's a governor. Uh, the process of cooptation of regional elites in Russia has retained many its basic features from Soviet time. It is centralized, it's closed uh, process, it's closed systems, uh, and uh, regional elites are mostly self-reproducing as uh, most of them are recruited from the within the region, from regional groups. And of course, there is an overwhelming domination of ruling party United uh, Russia with quite a modest presence of uh, other national parliament par partisans, parties and uh, even no presence of parties that are not presented at national level. Uh, what is new uh, that appeared after post-Soviet transition is uh, the inflow of businessmen and in politics, as well as the strengthening the position of so-called group of Siloviki. Uh, it's a people with military background. I stop by here and switch the floor to Alexei. Uh, thank you, Sergei. Uh, so I will present our uh, empirical findings and uh, of course, these findings are descriptive in nature, but nonetheless provide uh, just some useful insights into the role of higher education and regional pol political information in Russia. But firstly, uh, I would like to say just a couple of words about our data set that we used for this study. Uh, the data set, uh, as Sergey mentioned, includes only uh, regional, pol uh, regional parliaments members. Uh, so we used kind of positional approach to elite definition. And we define regional elite members as a group of uh, people holding a positions in regional parliaments. Uh, of course, regional elite group in general may include a lot of other people like members of regional governments, business people, and so on. So this is a quite heterogeneous group. 
And in order to homogenize a group of people that we analyzed, we decided to limit our sample by only parliament members. Uh, the data set was collected based on the official biographies that are usually published on the websites of the parliaments. These biographies are usually have a quite similar structure and contain more or less the same information. So we converted each biography into 194 indicators reflecting uh, basic information like age or gender, uh, educational background, career path, and so on. Uh, and uh, our final data set uh, inclu included, uh, includes 3,373 individuals. Uh, this data was collected during September, November 2017 and represents a uh, situation as for uh, September 2017. Uh, so uh, I will start with some uh, basic characteristics of, the, uh, of our sample. Uh, the average individual in our sample is 52 years old uh, with average time in the office equal to 6.3 years. Uh, we also can observe the imbalance in terms of gender representation. Uh, the share of women among elite members varies from 10% to 25% depending on age cohort. And also we observe quite high level of geographical mobility because more than a half of regional elite members gain their uh, elite position outside their home region. Uh, the next thing is the uh, educational attainment of elite members. Uh, first, we see that higher education is almost a necessary condition for entering elite class. Almost 90% of elite members have at least one higher education degree. However, around 10% of individuals have a vocational education. And also, some elite members uh, enter the elite position without higher education and obtain their higher education degree after entering uh, elite group. Uh, in terms of field of study, most elite members have graduated in uh, engineering and technology, social science, and education. However, these numbers significantly vary by age groups. The graph below here uh, represents the shares of elite members of different age groups graduated in different fields. And we can see that most elite members graduated in Soviet times before 1990 uh, have their degrees mostly in engineering and technology. At the same time, elite members representing younger age cohorts are graduated mainly in social sciences. And this situation in general uh, corresponds to the transformations of national higher education system because in 1990s, the share of university graduates in social science among all populations started to increase while the share of graduates in engineering declined. And mainly it was related to the transition to the uh, market economy and increasing labor market demand for graduates in uh, disciplines like economics, uh, public administration, management, and so on. Uh, our analysis sh uh, show that uh, the main producers of elite members uh, in Russian regions are classical, so-called classical comprehensive universities. But this can be mainly explained by the fact that uh, most comprehensive universities have large social science departments. Uh, and taking into account, we observe actually the same tendency as on the previous slide. So elite members representing older age cohorts are mostly graduated from engineering universities and younger elite members are mostly graduated from, from classical comprehensive universities. And finally, finally, we tried to check the hypothesis that regional elite groups are mostly shaped by the same field of study or by the same university. And in order to check this hypothesis uh, for each region, we uh, calculated uh, some kind of concentration index for the field of study and for the university. Uh, this index may vary from zero to one with the value of one corresponding to the situation when the whole regional elite group have the same educational background. Uh, and on these two graphs on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the distribution of this index across regions. And we can see in most cases, the values of this index does not exceed 0.2, meaning that in general, uh, regional elite groups are characterized by quite diverse uh, educational background in terms of universities and in terms of uh, fields of study. And now I'm proceeding to the conclusions. Uh, so firstly, our data shows that regional political elite members are more educated than the uh, education, uh, than the population in general. Uh, secondly, educational profile of elite members in terms of uh, fields of study does not differ significantly from non-elite. And in general, it corresponds to the transformations of uh, national higher education system when older 
uh, elite members uh, are mainly graduated in engineering and younger elite, me elite members are mainly uh, graduated in uh, social sciences. And finally, our analysis of concentration index shows that uh, social capital through the university does not seem essential in our case. And also, it is important to mention that comprehensive universities, classical comprehensive universities, still play an uh, important role uh, in elite formation, which they have uh, since the uh, Soviet times. So I would stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Sergei, um, Alexei, um, Tehi, Senior, Juicy, Malima. That has been a really helpful and um, stimulating set of presentations. And we've we've already got lots of questions. And um, I, I'm going to um, in, invite people to come forward and, and talk about them in turn. So um, please do post more questions if you have. But I think immediately the questions that were being raised are around for the first presentation, what we mean by culture. So Susan, um, do start. Oh, it's just a tricky curly question about culture, but it kind of strikes me that it is important and it matters. Um, and that actually what you're, the, the kind of rendition or the rendering there that is, is much more along the lines of a kind of, um, almost a kind of Bourdieuian kind of marks of distinction of various kinds of forms of consumption and so on. but. Stuart Hall's work, which strikes me as really useful and interesting, um, where he goes off and starts to think about what theory of culture for cultural studies. It's an essay in 1980 um, and actually looks at what he would describe as a kind of culturalist versus a structuralist kind of an account. Um, and I'm just kind of putting that out there because um, that enables you to actually see, for example, um, what might be dis distinctive around, let's say, a, a Soviet or a, a Russian culture versus China. Um, and that, that goes off in the direction of more civilizational kinds of analyses that enables you to kind of see some differences potentially between, let's say, the dominance and the expansion of a Western centric or ang Anglo kind of model, um, which is actually quite different to some extent than, let's say, a kind of French civilizational kind of cultural kind of analysis. So um, that was just a set of thoughts there really to get the debate going. Thank you, Susan. Would anyone like to respond to that? Well, I uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can respond, but I, even, I, I may try to reflect on that uh, because, well, when we uh, when we started this uh, uh, st uh, to, to study this this topic, uh, the really the, the starting point was that uh, that is it really tr true that uh, that there, there are no studies trying to find out what are the different uh, uh, cultural uh, activities and cultural relationships and cult cultural uh, impacts uh, that take place between higher education and, and society, uh, understood in, in a broad way. So that uh, the starting point was that we, we really should uh, have an empirical, uh, at least some kind of empirical basis for understanding what uh, if there can be find some common elements with the with the, with the relationship between cultural relationships uh, between higher education institutions and, and and societies and that's how we we started doing that so uh so this uh trying to give a, a, a starting point for for going more more deeper in, into this topic and the other thing was that we uh, got interested in, in the cultural imaginaries related to supported by higher education. And this is how when we uh, actually uh, found the, 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 the genre of, of uh, campus novels, uh, genre of, of uh, college movies, uh, and, and also the, the different ways uh, uh, higher education has influenced on, on, on popular imaginaries on what is research, what is university, what is to be a prof professor, to be a, uh, a student. And it may be assumed that, that this hits back to, to universities. So students come to universities with certain assumptions of what, is, what it means to be a student and, uh, and, and so forth. So, so um, 
so this is this is where the the, the starting points for for writing this this chapter and i i think that susan is, is right by asking it what is the different understanding of culture in different civilizations uh very fair question uh uh uh, but then we also should uh, complement that with asking what is the different assumptions, cultural assumptions of higher education in different civilizations. And, and this we have not done. I, I think this is a very good question. Can I just come in as to where the, some of our thinking kind of came from? We'd been involved with Bob Jessup on cultural political economy. And what was interesting about what Bob and Nyling and others were kept on kind of doing was that culture got reduced to discourse. And yet when you work on education, um, and education is about social reproduction um, and the making of nation and societies, you suddenly see the problem of cultural uh, kind of reduced to discourse when specifically you're looking at education as you know higher education or let's say schooling things as, as institutions that are involved in both making uh, nations societies and so on and that kind of takes you off then potentially in the direction of index Sinic, you know arabic you know and, and, and so on it goes um and that's where kind of and, and most recent work i'd say ir studies and so on has been forced into perhaps engaging along those kinds of lines. And I think it's potentially a fruitful set of lines, partly too, because it enables us to kind of see some of the work that's currently being done in China to try and make much more explicit what might be the idea of a Chinese university, although it's kind of deeply implicated in some of the kind of the globalizing processes and so on. Um, so I just put that there as, you know, let's say a, a, a really interesting agenda that I think um, a, a bunch of us could be actually kind of working on, um, but linking cultural political economy uh, together rather than go off in the cultural direction um, as if political economy, because both politics and, and economy are culturally anchored, if that makes any sense. They're the meanings that we make um, around forms of exchange, notions of um, power and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's just me <laughs> pushing a, um, a particular kind of line. But anyway, thank you very much for the, all the presentations. I found it really interesting. That's great. Thank you, Susan. And I think you're right. I think um, even, even in your presentation, um, there, there's a tension between the cultural organiz organizations and, and processes the universities were involved in, as opposed to the ways in which they were constructed. And it's that, there's an interesting tension there, isn't it, between the, the sort of representations of the university and the representations the university wants to create or, or, or make. Pete, um, would you want to come in on your question, which takes us to the rural urban debate? Sure. Uh, yes. Um very, very interesting presentation. And obviously, uh, Xenia mentioned um, the urban identity of, of uh, universities and how they process identity. Obviously, in the in the US um, now, some of the more satisfying analysis of uh, tensions in the US, cultural tensions, it um, has it that uh, there is a schism between the urban centers and the rural um, area um, in many areas of life, rather than thinking about um, you know, different regions being in tension with, with one another or so, so forth. Um, I often think about the US college town, that is to say, uh, you know, a secondary city rather than, uh, rather than the, the local state metropolis in, in that sense. And I also think about the um, medieval university where there were two options. Either you could put the university in a major city like Paris or Bologna or Prague, or you could put it out of the way like in Salamanca or Oxford or Pisa, um, two, two ways of thinking about where to put the university. Um, uh, and I wonder if you, could, if you could comment about those things. I've jumbled up a couple of topics there for you. Great, thanks, Pete. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, I guess that we haven't do a special focus between uh, these two types of universities uh, and two types connections between university uh, and uh, urban culture, uh, maybe because of the specifics of uh, our uh, culture, cultural uh, background, uh, because, for example, in Russia, we have no uh, uh, 
we have no college town uh we have no college towns yeah that's also um only uh urban universities which is established by the official government um uh, but it's a very interesting topic and thank you uh, for your written uh, comment between this uh cultural misunderstanding between different uh territories well I, I i would also uh, reflect a bit on on that because uh i think that maybe maybe the uh, the difference between city and and countryside is uh could be approached from the perspective of center and periphery and and this is this was one of the social theories in 1970s but i i think there is some truth in that uh, showing that uh, that uh, the relationship be between power and uh, and economic power and influence they are also related to to remoteness to to space uh and the other thing was what you asked about college city and medieval city well uh in college city you have a campus uh and in the, especially in, in, in anglo-american countries uh actually there is a college city also in in, in northern europe like in finland uh and whereas in, in uh, typical to medieval university was that it it never had a campus it was spread in the city so the social environment for campus university and non-campus university is quite different. Uh, the other is is more uh, concentrated on itself, and the other one is is more in the middle of the city or the society. So all this is just uh, I think it's it's interesting uh, idea. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, let's move on. And a slightly different angle here comes from Ian. Ian McNair, your question around around um, the role of elite universities in trying to in trying to change the culture of elitism within them within themselves in relationship to society. Ian. Hello. Can you see me and hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Oh, good. Um, I, I see that the, the latest uh, comment in the chat is about the nation. I think I'm more concerned about the state and universities and universities' role in developing citizenship. And for me, that means um, reconciling with developing the individual. So you're developing a diversity of citizens and a tolerance for that difference and indeed a lauding of it, a praising of it. Um, my concern um, is that the elite who are in charge of both the political and economic structures in the country um, seem to believe not in diversity, but in hierarchy um, and self-aggrandizement um, and, um, if you like, privileging themselves and a neglect, to put it benevolently, almost a contempt for others below them and, in a global sense, um, almost a fear of the difference and therefore, the reaction of people who are afraid, managers who are not confident in themselves, of aggression towards rather than accommodation with. And I do wonder about whether you know how far universities have that ethical moral obligation. And I'm concerned then that I see German and Austrian rectors being exposed as having plagiarized their theses. And in the UK, accusations of bullying, mainly in elite universities. Um, Durham, Imperial, UCL, um, etc., which doesn't come through in the kind of universities I work in all my life, the, the accessible universities, where there is much more, I think, of that um, recognition of the need for social progress and therefore collaboration rather than competition and sharing rather than domination. And, and, Final comment, the Robbins Report, which for those outside the UK was in 1963 and was the most um, what informative and uh, critical examination of the future and nature of higher education, said the four aims were, um, you know, to prepare people for jobs, um, to do it in a way that developed the general powers of the mind, to do research, but also to develop a common culture. And I think that had the concept of that common culture, which is included in a later report, the Deering report, about tolerance, about argument, but not uh, aggressive disputation, about listening to others, about, 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 and that collegiality, 
um, within the university should also be reflected in society. So the question basically is, what role does the university have in setting those standards, which are encapsulated in the standards in public life, which parliament has passed but doesn't observe, um, about openness, integrity, information, accountability, and tolerance of others? Great, Ian, you've, you've taken the culture in a very different way there to, to mean sort of a moral economy, and I think that's a really important question. Yes. What, what, what role universities have as privilege machines for deconstructing um, that, that, that sense of privilege? And I think that question could go to any of the speakers. Would anyone like to come forward? Terry, would, would, you, Terry, would you like to uh, say something on this? Go ahead, Yossi, you can go fast. Uh, no, Terry, I was, I was suggesting that maybe you could say something. Oh, I, found, um, I found it very interesting to think about um, maybe something that Susan picked up on, or I, I was reading the, the chats there, um, about the, uh, the ways in which we are kind of able to capture uh, by, by looking at, for example, the national context, whether we are able to capture some of the mechanisms through which universities and cultures are intertwined. Um, and I was thinking about this sort of like, you know, there are very specific cultural formations or cultural sort of um, customs, for example, uh, in different countries, which, uh, which sort of universities can have an impact on and which in, in turn uh, have an impact on the universities, but then on the other hand, looking at the um, looking yeah. at the sort of like uh, transnational or international elements of of academia, uh, we may not be able to capture all of the interesting uh, facets of of the cultural contributions if we stick to kind of like a, a national mm -hmm. somehow a national context and um, of uni yes of universities and. Um, uh, if we're looking at, for example, the um, uh, like the, what we tried to do in our chapter was was to to show that that certain kinds of, of cultural uh, imageries or cultural activities uh, span the the different sort of a different country contexts. But what I recognize, sort of looking back at our process. That obviously our our approach was probably rather Eurocentric or or sort of global North and 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 Western approach to things. And if we were to uh, adopt a more um, a broader understanding of, of of what is culture, for example, um, and and taking into indigenous knowledges and indigenous cultures and the role of universities or in engagement of universities with those, we might have ended up with that with a slightly different understanding and a different kind of empirical results as well. Maybe that was sort of um, the first thing that, that came to my mind at this point of the conversation. Um, Sergi, Alexi, do you want to respond around this question of... The, the, yes, just, just, just brief, brief, brief oh, comment. Just, uh, yes, I'm not sure about the other national context, but speaking about Russian context, I would say that uh, the cultural norms of uh, political elites, regional political elites in Russia is highly dominated by the political values and political procedures uh, of a federal elite, but not academic one. So I think that uh, values and uh, norms and vision of life of political elites is overlapping uh, mixture of uh, academic norms and political values, uh, but in the rank context it differ. And if we are talking about the composition of uh, legislative, uh, regional legislative body in, in Russia, we can see quite a diversity of uh, universities and uh, majors. There is no just three or four universities that uh, provide a lead to, to Russian regional, regional uh, bodies. Uh, not talking about uh, federal elite, that is, uh, is quite, quite the, the, the case for this uh, consolidation in, in three or four universities, especially St. Petersburg State University. But at regional level, it's quite diverse. And in this sense, we can, uh, can expect they, they have quite uh, uh, di diverse uh, views uh, of, 
of civic engagement and their role in uh, uh, local policy and local uh, politics. Uh, and uh, it's, it's important to mention that uh, we, uh, in, in our analysis, have the, the people who gained their lead position 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I guess, at regional level, first political elite position. And uh, I would say that as uh, the, the vertical stratification of uh, higher education landscape in Russia uh, will we'll be growing. We, we can see the, the situation that uh, Jan said about then just uh, uh, this isolation of uh, elites and it's more concentration over just uh, a small amount of universities. But 15 years ago, uh, at the very early stages of uh, new Russia higher education system, uh, it was quite diverse. Now, uh, now I think that it's it's quite different, and at, at federal level again, it, it's it's quite different. So the process is still ongoing. Great, thank you, CJ. Um, I'm aware we're running out of time. We still have um, time for a couple more questions, and I'm going to ask Brian Pusser and Michael Hulsher if they can come forward and ask their questions. One is a really interesting question around the role of the courts and and who educates our lawyers and um, judges and Michael about national cultures. Pete, um, Brian, please. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I think Sergey just spoke a little bit to the notion of the concentration of elites at the federal level, at the sort of uh, national level. So I think what I would just add is um, we need to be careful not to romanticize the university's role um, in, 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 in culture anywhere around the globe. Um, one of the roles of the university is instantiating these very powerful norms elite norms and standard stories that have been brought forward. So it's a contest between the formation of powerful norms and elites and um, a much more grassroots cultural movements. And the university is a kind of site of those contests. Um, but I think we've romanticized the university's role uh, over time in ways that have been somewhat counterproductive in our, in our efforts to, to get at the true purposes of the contemporary university. Uh, to sort out a kind of um, vision and then the reality of elite formation and reproduction in the universities themselves. That's very interesting. I, I, I lots of think about there. Michael. Yeah, thank you for this um, opportunity. I, it was much more um, kind of a comment just because we talked about national cultures and I just wanted to give a caveat here. Although um, I, thinking about it further, um, it's also a question of um, how, in, to what extent actually universities add a, an international um, culture on top of national culture, then if there might be a, a difference between uh, what we already discussed with regard to periphery and uh, center. So um, it might also go into that direction even further. Um, yeah, but much more though, kind of a comment. <laughs> Great, thank you, Michael. And um, I, I think that question around the dangers of, of simpl simplifying cultures is a very important one. But also, the, I think Brian's comment around the dangers of us romanticizing what we do is one which we need to again and again come back to. Are there any final responses to those to those questions or thoughts? Well, uh, I would like to agree with 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 Brian because uh, we should not uh, romanticize. Uh, uh, maybe the 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 meaning of of or, or the the impact of of universities the majority of our bad polit politicians are trained in universities and we should not uh, forget that uh, but uh, what uh, what uh, we were thinking when writing our chapter on cultural contributions is to uh, as a message to to high education politicians also to r remember that uh, that uh, the contributions of higher education are much more than just about economics and money. So that, mm -hmm. that it's, it's really important that we understand the role of, of, of higher education creating, preserving cultures, not only national cultures, but, but uh, the global cultures. The essence of, of, of science scholarship has always been international. Uh, and it still is. 
so that that uh, and and this I think makes you know the the positions of universities a bit difficult in in so, in societies that emphasize nat nationalistic values. And a strong element in in science and universities is internationalization. Is they are international intellectual uh, supporters of 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 free thinking. So um, okay. So maybe this is the good way to, to stop. Good. Um, any, any other comments than that? Or just, should we end with that defense of internationalism? Um, I, I, I think just you're, you're absolutely right that, um, that, that, that universities, um, even before universities, research has created international cultures. I think what's been very helpful about today is that you've made us think much more specifically around what sorts of cultures universities think they're creating and or are creating um the, the fact that we often don't think about or attend enough to um the elites we create and the elite cultures we create and what that might mean for attitudes to access to university and and to our own romanticism of what we do so lots here to think further for i think this is, shows the value of your contributions to this um book i'd encourage everyone to go in and read it um and um to keep coming back to join these conversations next week um we have our webinar is um on tuesday at two o'clock it's entitled knowledge societies higher education political cleavages paradoxes in search of explanations thank you all very much um contributors and participants um, for all your questions comments it's been um, a really interesting webinar see you all again soon bye, -bye. thank you david thank you bye thank you all <laughs>